Now we are going to be uh, getting engaged into a very inspiring session. The name of the session itself is Inspiring Conversations. The theme behind Inspiring Conversations is uh, learning from the journey of successful entrepreneurs and learning from their experiences so that you do exactly something similar to what they have done and add to your style of working. Uh, friends, uh, this is the 30th episode. Uh, today, the chief guest is a very interesting personality. I had the opportunity of sharing 45 minutes of conversations with him yesterday and he, he literally blew me off. A phenomenal gentleman, hardcore experience, hands on the business, lot of businesses, versatile entrepreneur, globally educated. I will invite Mr. Valrani, the junior Valrani, Naveen Valrani on stage and we'll get into this conversation. Uh, it's a social initiative of St. Angelo's VNCD Ventures. It's our give back to the entrepreneurial world. We have thousands and lakhs of followers the world over. Inspiring Conversations is an app which can be downloaded. And there are thousands of entrepreneurs who are using the anecdotes shared by experienced entrepreneurs like Naveen and applied in their business models. And we have got success stories from them too. The objective is to share your experiences and enrich other entrepreneurs to be better and smarter entrepreneurs and grow faster than what they were growing otherwise. So, Naveen, uh, please have a seat. Uh, we should get into the conversation. Uh, Naveen Valrani, of course, Al Shiravi Group is something which is known, very, very well known in this part of the world. And uh, they're into multiple businesses. As we start the conversation, this is a two-part conversation. One is I'll be having it with Naveen. And the other part, I will encourage a lot of questions coming up when your house is open for questions, you can ask your unanswered questions to Naveen and I'm sure with his experience, he's going to be definitely satisfying your requirement. Naveen Valrani, born in India, grew up in Dubai, studied in the US, studied in the UK. How do you describe yourself as an entrepreneur? Well, it's, um, it's interesting when you say, how do I describe myself? Uh, most, most entrepreneurs, when you speak to them, they talk about how they're self-made. And I'm firmly of the belief that there is no such thing as a self-made man. There's always help along an entrepreneur's journey. And uh, that starts from very, very early ages with, with a mentor and continues for pretty much a lifetime. Uh, in my case, uh, I'm, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be born into a business family. My father, who was on stage just a few minutes ago, was a very early mentor and continues to be my mentor. And, uh, you know, I was born into the right family, had the right guidance, uh, followed by the right education. And uh, education is something I hold uh, very dear to my heart. So uh, that journey is, is very much continuing. So I would say if I, I, I would describe myself as an education entrepreneur, if I had to use one, one phrase. So what excites you to get into new businesses? Because being you're a non-technical educated guy. Your education is always in business, not into the technical industry. But majority of your business lines are technical, like the air conditioning part, the construction part, uh, the facility management part. These are all with technical backgrounds. When you decide expansion, of course, your dad started some businesses. You have multiplied it uh, basically in the last uh, 15 years, one and a half decade. You have got them multiplied. How do you decide expansion when you're on the verge of doing it? So it depends, you know, across, across my journey. Early on, it was very much on, about return on investment. It was very, very financial driven. But as I entered my 40s, it was more about the impact that I create and will create in society. So you, you tend to, your, your goalposts change, your, your, your aims change. Uh, and when you enter a venture now, at least when I enter a venture, it's not only about the financial return, which is extremely important, but it's also about the social impact. So you're a Wharton student. I'm sure that has given you the vision of how you can multiply the business. You finished your Wharton education in probably 1993. And subsequently, you had a big stint of doing business with your dad's leadership. Your dad is uh, out of active leadership for the past, uh, since 2007, approximately. Yeah, so my and father is interesting. I mean, he, he stepped back from the day-to-day -day running of the group right. in 2007 only for the global financial crisis to follow immediately after. 
So he stepped back in and said, you know, let me make sure that you guys are uh, doing a good job. And then, a but he's more of, successful than Narayan Murthy. Uh, uh, yeah, in, in, he in many ways, he stepped back and yes. Infosys went down further. <laughs> yeah, in in my father's case, he stepped back, handed over to the second generation, which was uh, inculcated into the group since the the eighties. Uh, and did it very, very successfully. So it's one of the rare success stories in, in this region of a business being handed over so successfully to a second generation. So you are very passionate uh, about education. You always make sure that you are on the top of the education that you keep giving yourself. And around 2011, 2012 or 13, you got into an MBA program uh, after your full working experience with the group. And post that MBA from the London uh, business, uh, School of Business, after you finished that MBA, you got into a different pa parameter for expansion. You started uh, taking over companies, mergers and acquisitions. What was the differentiator between, before that program and after that program? I think first and foremost, the London Business School MBA gave me a toolkit. It gave me a toolkit on, on how to do acquisitions, how to look at businesses, and how to truly value them. And valuation is a very, very subjective field. So once you know the art of valuation, I won't call it a science, you can really, really play it to your advantage to maximize financial returns. So I think the London Business School gave me that toolkit. And then this region is really ripe for uh, acquisitions because we don't have very developed public markets. So it means for private investors and for, for people willing to put money behind entrepreneurs, there are tremendous opportunities. You have been exposed to the developed market and the developing market, and you're operating out of Dubai. How has being operative from Dubai helped you in business? Oh, Dubai is just the most wonderful city in the world. Uh, I know Miss, Miss Manisha alluded to it earlier in the, in the discussion, but really, if you're living in this city, I do not see why you would want to live anywhere else in the world. How has the environment helped you in taking decisions? Well, first and foremost, it's the ease of doing business here. Uh, it's just a very, very easy place to do business. And uh, more importantly, we have a leader that is such a visionary and with someone who is moving so quickly that if you don't move at his pace, or at least don't attempt to move at his pace, uh, you'll be left way, way behind. And that just is so exciting. How do you create benchmarks for your organization as the CEO of the group? Well, we have the usual, you know, we set KPIs to our, our profit center heads. Uh, we monitor them very, very closely. But benchmarks, are, I, I believe, you know, financial metrics are only part of the game. It really boils down to the culture that you create within an organization and the ability to lead and the ability to inspire. And I think that's really what takes organizations forwards. I, th I think too many organizations are too financially driven. You have got a workforce of more than 10,000 people. So how do you keep 10,000 people inspired? What is the success anecdote that you would like to share? Well, you know, I, uh, first and foremost, I, I, the 10,000 people, I, I look at it as 10,000 families. So what drives me to come to work every day is that the decisions I make impact 10,000 families. And that means a lot to me. You know, that, res that responsibility is a, is a big, big burden uh, and, very, very, uh, and something I take very, very seriously. How different do you manage your team compared to the other entrepreneurs in the industry? Well, that's a, that's a, you know, I try and not c compare myself with other entrepreneurs, but I, lo I look at myself as someone who loves to serve. Uh, and that's a as a result of the readings I had very early on in my life. So Mahatma Gandhi was, uh, was and is one of my inspirations. And his whole philosophy in serving a nation is something that I, has rubbed off, me, rubbed off on me in terms of, of my organization and the way I look at it. All your business sectors are basically business to business. Recently, you have started venturing into business to customers, to consumers. What is the change that you see and what are the additional responsibilities? Well, first and foremost, uh, a business to consumer uh, model is one where every single human being is either a customer or is an influencer. So you have to act accordingly and you have to ensure that your organization acts accordingly. So it's a complete change of framework not only from a, a staffing perspective, but also from an investor perspective, because even the investors have to behave as ambassadors. And that's a very, very important mindset, and that's one, not one easy to shift when you've been in B2B businesses for 40 plus years. As a B2B businessman, as an entrepreneur, what are the value additions that you give to your customers? 
uh, not the not the pricing and delivery on time and quality is great. What is the different that you do which has helped you to grow, retain the customer and add more customers through referral programs of your existing customers? What is the different that you do to them for adding value? So value addition is of course the core of any entrepreneurial venture. Uh, but the, what, you know, the key again for entrepreneurial ventures is to go from that startup phase where you have early adopters and innovators as your customers to the majority of the population. And that scaling is never easy. And it depends a lot on the team you select, the kind of financing you have, uh, and your ability to scale. Uh, and that comes with a certain management ethos, uh, which is, which is this, this continuous drive to, to expand. What are the fund management policies of your group that you have brought in after you have taken reins of the, uh, of the activity? Well, uh, our group has always been very, very financially disciplined. Uh, and that's really the secret of our success because you can, you can want to create max, you know, maximum social impact, but that is absolutely pointless if the organization is not financially sustainable. Uh, so we've always been very, very financially disciplined, and that is really what has, has caused us and led us to grow with, with what Dubai has become. What was your strategy when the economic scenario really went bad in this part of the world, around the 2009 and 10 and 11? So that was an interesting time for us uh, because... Your expenses were the same and your, I'm sure the revenue must have dipped down. Yeah. How did you manage that situation? So uh, first and foremost, uh, we created what we called, we actually called it a war council. Uh, so we all, all the CEOs in the group, we all got together, we sat in a room and we said, okay, let's, let's see where our risks, risks are right now and how do we mitigate those risks? And there were a number of strategies. Of course, uh, my father came back, out, out, uh, came back to becoming active, uh, and he led the way, uh, and we were very, very much hands-on. But most importantly is we had a very, very strong balance sheet. Uh, we had been through a crisis in the mid-'80s where we did not have a strong balance sheet, uh, so we had learned. So when this crisis came along, we almost welcomed it with open arms and saw it as a massive opportunity. Uh, which it did turn out to be. In fact, Dubai turned around a lot quicker than almost anyone expected. Amongst your group companies, which is the most profitable company and how do you look at it in terms of expansion? So that's interesting. That varies. Uh, our engineering services side of our businesses are very, very profitable. Um, our logistics are very profitable. Um, our education is doing phenomenally well, our first venture. Uh, our printing and packaging has very, very, done very well. Historically, our oil and gas services have done very well. So there's no real one sector that really dominates in terms of profitability. Um, but in terms of future expansion, our bets are on education. Uh, and that's really where you'll see a lot of our capital flowing into the, what we call the Arcadia, the Arcadia schooling system. What are the plans for Arcadia and why do you plan to expand that faster than the other sectors? So, uh, first and foremost, the plans for Arcadia, we plan to educate uh, roughly about 3,000 students over the next four years. So, uh, there will be 3,000 students running through Arcadia schools. Uh, that's our immediate objective. Uh, why education? Uh, because we see the, the, the Dubai economy evolving. Evolving from a construction and oil services economy to one that is a lot more retail and consumer oriented. We see continuous population growth and a continuous demand for high quality education. Uh, so that's really where we are really uh, putting, our, putting our bet on. Uh, and uh, Arcadia is just extremely exciting. We have something very, very unique. We opened the doors uh, you know, just last August. And in our first year, we've attracted over uh, 350 children. Uh, and we, have, you know, we are the most successful premium school, new premium school in Dubai. And that speaks volumes. And that's really because of the kind of offering we have. And it's just a very, very special place to be. How do you fine tune your decision making process in a growing organization like yours, based on the political scenario and the economic scenario around this region? So in terms of decision-making process, what I believe is the most important is culture. You really have to instill a culture of openness and comfort so people can speak their minds. Does it happen? Yeah, I, I actually believe it does. Uh, and you know, as far as we're concerned, that culture stems from fairness. And you know, we had a chat yesterday. Uh, for us, equality in the workplace is extremely important. And this equality not only is equality ac across race, religion, caste, creed, but it's also equality among gender. 
uh, and His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum leads by example in that front with the number of female ministers he has in his cabinet and the Al Sharawi group is not far behind. 50% uh, of my direct reports are female and I'm predominantly a, a construction services organization. What are your review mechanisms? Because it is said that for an entrepreneur, every review is a new view. Every situation needs to be reviewed. So do you have a pattern to review how your growth of the organization is happening? Yeah, we do have review meetings, uh, but it, what's very important, I, I was actually having a chat with my financial controller just last week, and I was explaining the entire team of accountants that what I do not want to see is them driving things up the organization for approval. So, you know, th there's the margin is too low on this project, go to CEO for the approval. Uh, that's not the kind of organization we are. The kind of organization we are is we empower our business leaders to make decisions, to make mistakes, and then to come back and say, look, this was the process I went through in terms of thinking, and this is where I went wrong. And that's really what differentiates us and allows us to compete with organizations, not only in, in Dubai, but throughout the Middle East and throughout the world. So how is your feedback mechanism after a mistake is committed by a particular segment of your team? So uh, I had a session today with one of my business heads, uh, and she reached out to me uh, by WhatsApp and said, you know, do you have 20 minutes? Uh, and I was on my way to the gym, and I said, you know, I can meet you, meet you outside the gym. So she drove down. Uh, and we had a cup of coffee in, in what was essentially a bar, but, uh, but it was just a casual chat. And she told me, look, I've made these mistakes. And I said, you know, what, what took you, you know, what, uh, what caused these decisions to be made? And she explained her logic and I was really, I, I, I almost admired her, I did admire her for the fact that she could speak about her mistakes. And that in itself for me was a huge, huge strength. So when people admit their mistakes and the reviews that I have with my direct reports, one of the questions I ask is, what, would, what do you say is your biggest weakness? If you had to do things again, what would you do differently? So I actually appreciate people who come out and are able to talk about their mistakes and their failures and their weaknesses, because that in itself is a tremendous strength. So it is said that the success of the organization depends on the quality of the people they have. How do you recruit people? How do you train them? And how do you retain them? Okay, so firstly, I, I want to say I believe that uh, we uh, and, and I have the best team that there is, and, ma and many of them are here today. So, you know, really, honestly, I think as, as Al Shirawi and Arcadia, we just have an absolutely phenomenal team. How do we recruit them? Uh, that is one area where we pay a lot of attention right from the top. So I'm involved in, 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 in a lot of recruiting positions, even those that do not report directly to me. Those interviews aren't very long. Um, obviously due to my restriction of time, but I'm typically on a Skype call with someone that would be three layers removed from me for five minutes. What are your parameters for selection? So I'm, letting, I'm giving you too many secrets here. <laughs> well, the objective of inspiring conversations is to stake your success anecdotes so that they can implement. But let me tell you, my friend, even Abhishek Bachchan could not become Amitabh Bachchan. So there will be two types of entrepreneurs, one who will try to do the same thing better than you and one who will fail in it. So you, there is no harm in sharing it. Um, well, uh, yeah, Abhishek Bachchan could not be Amitabh Bachchan <laughs> and uh, that's for sure. Uh, and I'm going to have a tough time being Mohan Valrani, but I hope to be what Salman Khan is to Salim Khan as opposed to Abhishek Bachchan to Amitabh Bachchan. <laughs> The advantage of this conversation is we want every Naveen Valrani to be a Salman Khan. That is the objective of uh, inspiring conversations. Well, first and foremost, I need to go to the gym a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> well, he doesn't have your hairstyle. You're better than that. <laughs> That's true. But uh, coming to our re the recruiting and what I look for, um, first and foremost, I look for communication. If a person is not able to communicate, um, that's a complete non-starter. And it doesn't matter what the position is. So a lot of people say, you know, it's production. So, you know, they don't need to talk. No, they always need to talk. Uh, so I think that is extremely important. Uh, education, because of my own personal uh, focus on education, we look for um, people who are well-educated, uh, who have done well, even at the school level. So I'm one of those few who ask you for school grades. Like, you know, what'd you get for math in school, for instance? Uh, and people are like shocked, like, why is he asking me for my school grades? Um, and then also medium of instruction. 
uh, and I think it's important for us that people have a, a command over the English language. Uh, and you know, these days you'll be surprised no matter where you're educated, even in the, in, in the States or the UK, there are just so few people who can write well. I know there's a tremendous shortage of people who write, write well and we, we truly value that. What is your line of priority? What is your line of priority? Shareholder, team, customer? Team. Uh, team comes first, uh, customer second, and shareholder third. Well, when the balance sheet is strong, you don't need shareholders. So, <laughs> no, you, so you can afford to say that. You no, can no, afford to say no, that. No, you always need shareholders. They're extremely important. You always need investors. But I am blessed that I have the most wonderful group of investors, uh, a group that has been extremely supportive uh, of my ventures over the last uh, t 25 plus years. Uh, and, uh, and they've basically allowed me to, uh, to build up organizations the way, you know, in the values that I believe in. Uh, and I believe, you know, happy, happy people, I don't like to use the word employees, but happy people, uh, once you have happy people or a happy team, you'll have happy customers. You believe a lot in collaboration. Your recent past growth has been collaborative growth. What do you think about collaboration? What has this taught you? Oh, yeah, collaboration. There is just so much I can say, but, uh, you know, one of our, our more recent collaborative ventures was actually in the, in the city of New York. So we took one of our business to, uh, businesses to New York. We partnered with a New York firm for what is Chiller Services, so looking after air conditioning, heavy tonnage air conditioning equipment. And within the first seven months of operation, we've actually won the Empire State Building. So today when you walk into what is arguably the, the most famous building in the world, uh, the cooling is done by one of our companies. Wow, wow. And friends, even uh, they played a role in the world's tallest structure, the Burj Khalifa. And I was very proud to know that they have a commercial printing sector and they are the largest company between Singapore and Rome. Rome. Between Singapore and Rome. So uh, these uh, are the some uh, great milestones every entrepreneur or any business organization would love to achieve. Uh, when you talk about milestones, you get a feeling of pride. Do you plan further milestone creations or they happen and then you realize it's a milestone? Do you work towards creating a milestone or they just happen and then you realize it? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I work towards creating milestones and particularly personal mile, milestones where I pat myself on the back. For the organization? In terms of the organization, I believe the best days are ahead of us. And I think that is when you truly want to want to judge an entrepreneur, you have to judge his or her optimism. Uh, because by definition, an entrepreneur is an optimist. As an entrepreneur, how do you look at India today? Well, there's so much positivity uh, that Manisha said about India. I'm almost, uh, I'm almost scared to say anything negative. But I think, uh, I think India is a very, very complex market uh, and a market that is very, very difficult for an outside investor. Uh, it is, you know, the political s situation currently is extremely stable and extremely bullish. And economically, we seem to be doing all, all the right things. But then just two weeks ago, you know, we read in the papers about the, the incidents that happened in Haryana and the breakdown of law. And as a foreign investor, that really worries me. You know, I say that, you know, this is a country where if the political dynamic changes and that could very easily change, uh, you know, things can easily turn the other way. So do you think it as an opportunity or a challenge? Because there are a set of entrepreneurs who will think that these challenges in the country are a brilliant opportunity to enter in. If it is smooth and hunky-dory, there are too many entrepreneurs who will come in and the opportunity becomes expensive. How do you look at it? So net-net, if you look at the data, I think uh, foreign investors have uh, destructed more value in India than created. Uh, it has been an absolute bloodbath over the years for foreign investors. And change of regulations happen where, you know, uh, what is a, f a great promise turns it to be a great disaster. India holds tremendous opportunity, but we've been saying that for 30 years. Uh, and yes, we're, you know, we have a, a government that's very forward thinking. We have demonetization, which can be argued right now. I mean, the, the jury is still out whether it was truly a success or not. And the more recent data shows that uh, it's actually more likely not to be a success than one that is, at least among the economists. So, so India worries me. India really, really concerns me. Uh, tremendous opportunity, tremendous growth, but extremely volatile. So do you believe in higher the risk, more the profit? Yes, of course, there is a, a risk-return correlation. Uh, but as a foreigner, uh, when you don't have experience about how things work within a country, uh, it becomes extremely difficult. And the laws like, you know, the, 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 RERA, the RERA Act, 
is, is very comforting. You know, I was extremely pleased when I was hearing the first panel. Uh, but I think India has a long, long way to go, a long way to go, particularly for us based in Dubai. Here we have a visionary leader, uh, someone who's trained his, his son as the crown prince for the last 10 plus years by his side. Uh, and we just have a tremendous belief in the future of this city. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I was telling you yesterday, I think when we grow old, hopefully that will never happen, but when we, but when we grow old uh, and look back, we'll be telling our grandkids that, you know, when that mega city was built, we were there. And I think that's just a very, very special feeling. So I'm just a very, very pro-Dubai person, uh, and uh, I think I always will be. So you're averse to high level of risk. You're a safe entrepreneur. You like to make calculated moves, select safer cities where there is transparency, safety, balance, normalcy. Uh, not necessarily. Um, I would say, for instance, I, find, I would find it probably easier to make, make returns for my shareholders in Africa than I would in India. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I mean, Africa, of course, they don't have the, the economic institutions. India's building some great economic institutions. But there are so many smart people in India and people who know the environment inside out. How am I ever going to compete with them? Uh, so, you know, I, I, and I'm not saying that they're not smart people in Africa, but uh, the, the background I have, the education, and the way I think, I think I find it easier. Uh, to make money in Africa. There are just uh, some tremendous business people in India who are, who are really swallowing up uh, large parts of the pie that's available. When you talk about so many sectors, basically technical sectors, mm -hmm. uh, you, do, you strongly believe from the pattern of your organization, you strongly believe in backward integration. Does it help your uh, overall profitability in terms of doing the business? No, it doesn't actually always help our overall profitability. Many times it's strategic. And the reason it's strategic is because we want to control quality levels. So we like, we like to control the entire chain, uh, pretty much like Steve, Steve Jobs did. You know, everything from the hardware through to the software. We want to control the whole, the whole chain so that we deliver a product that we believe is the kind of offering we want to give. Fantastic. Friends, one last question and then the house is open for questions. We'll have some interactive questions from the audience as well. Very short questions so that he can give quick answers and we can cover more questions. Uh, how do you plan the next five years journey for your group as a team leader, as a thought leader? Oh, you know, I constantly tell my shareholders the best years for our group are ahead of us. Uh, we have just a tremendous future, uh, not only in education, but in printing and packaging, in logistics. Uh, we just see a very, very bright future. Uh, we have a very switched on, hands on management team. Uh, and I believe we're attracting some of the best people there are, there are because of our values. People want to work for Al Shirawi because they know it's an organization that treats people with fairness. And that will always continue. So I truly believe with His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum at the, at the helm of the city of Dubai, with the kind of government he has and created, uh, we are in for some amazing years in Dubai. Fantastic. So friends, the house is open for questions. Yes, gentlemen. Hi. Um, kind of might be slightly personal, but it's, it's also business related. So you spoke about the relationship between yourself and your father in doing business together. Did you have situations uh, where you agreed to disagree and uh, then still got your way? Yeah, great question. So yes, you know, those situations have, have existed, but you know, my father for the large part of my career was also my boss. And I looked at myself as a, as a professional in that respect, that if, if he had a decision that I disagreed with, I would communicate my disagreement, but then I would say the decision is yours. Uh, but my father's style was actually quite unique in the sense that almost, you know, I joined business at the age of, uh, of 21. And he pretty much empowered me to run things the way I wanted to. He actually almost never monitored me. Uh, and did he I, give I, you that feeling and did it really happen or? It really happened, it really happened. Or he is he saying it just because he's sitting here? <laughs> <laughs> no, it really happened. He would visit me in terms of professionally in the, in the business space uh, about once a year. So he would come down to my office once a year because we have annual, annual board meetings uh, by, where we set budgets. So that, that would be the time he would come. And then it would just be dinner table conversations, very casual, I'd seek advice. Uh, and he would really, um, you know, we'd debate and we'd discuss and, and really that's how, uh, how it, it played out. So I was very, very lucky in that respect. 
Yes, Rohit. Okay. The policy has been guide, but don't interfere. In fact, uh, Mr. Mohan Valrani was responsible for Naveen to be more focused towards making sure that the communication skills that he develops during the process of education need to be the prime most, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, correct. Yeah. I mean, so my, my father that, was That was a fantastic guideline to the growing up son when he joined the business in 1993. I think pre-post, uh, pre uh, that e era and post, communication was a very important tool. But what's interesting also, I wouldn't say it only was communication, it was practical communication. So growing up, you know, we're Sindhis. And uh, whenever my parents wanted to talk in secret like, or in front of us, or wanted to, they would switch to Sindhi because none of us understood Sindhi. None of the children understood <laughs> Sindhi. So one day I asked my father as I was growing up, I said, shouldn't we learn Sindhi? You know, it's, it's, our, it's our culture, it's our language. He said, don't waste your time. <laughs> it's a dying language. He still wanted to continue the secret discussions. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, but, but his focus on the English language from the very, very beginning was absolutely tremendous. Fantastic. In fact, uh, the class and finesse with which you speak, now I know whom does Robin Sharba copy. <laughs> Even in terms of the hairstyle. <laughs> Even in terms of the hairstyle. <laughs> Rohit. So just taking what Rajesh said forward, you know, Naveen, you have a phenomenal personality. And uh, see, everything uh, revolves around leadership. So what kind of leadership uh, uh, you, know, you follow? And uh, do you do a critical self-analysis? And uh, second part is, uh, what are the means and methods you are using to create the next generation leadership? So in terms of the style, I like to, I like to call my, my style of leadership uh, what is called a level five leadership, which is a, a, it's in essence a service leadership. So in, you know, I go to work every day, I lead to serve. And again, that stems from Mahatma Gandhi's philosophy of serving a nation. Uh, and that's really the leadership that model that I like to follow. Um, in terms of how we're preparing the next generation, uh, we have a host of business leaders within our group, uh, uh, fantastic professionals, many of them are here today, who are really being groomed to take over from, uh, as we, we go from a family business to what is essentially going to be an entirely professional setup. Thank Last you. two questions. Last two questions. Yes, Vinit. Uh, here, sir. Uh, uh, one small question: That uh, what is a healthy percentage of growth uh, uh, a business should have every year? What kind of uh, growth is a healthy growth? That's a good question. So, you know, in the world of private equity and uh, public markets, there's just this tremendous focus on growth. But there, uh, and I think that's actually a very, very dangerous game. So, there are times where you should not be growing. So do not put, I'm not sure if you're an entrepreneur, but do not put this unending pressure on yourself to grow. Because sometimes the, the forces against growth are so large that if you end up growing, you will end up burning yourself. And that's happened to me also over the years. So I've learned the hard way. Uh, at times you just have to accept that really the, for, you know, the market in the environment is not right and we will not grow. And I think it takes a lot of courage as a leader to admit that to your team. Last question, yes. Yajo. Yes. Yes, good evening. Uh, as an entrepreneur with all these solid background, definitely there is a fear factor always around in every businessman's mind or the way he thinks. So what hits you very hard while taking decisions? Well, you know, every human being, and an entrepreneur is included, uh, have various fears. Uh, and uh, in terms of my biggest fear, in fact, my younger brother, uh, he asked me the question the other day over dinner. He said, what are you most worried about? And I, I told him, honestly, I, I, I'm actually not worried about anything in terms of nothing keeps me up at night uh, in terms of where our businesses are going and what's going to happen. Um, when I look at the data that's available, I have a tremendous belief in the resources this country has financially, uh, regardless of where the oil price moves. I have a tremendous belief in the ability of the leadership to make the right decisions and to keep us safe and secure. Uh, and that's also extremely important. I mean, I asked him, you know, because safety and security, as it comes up in so many discussions when it comes to fear, I said, where do you feel safer today, London or Dubai? 
And he said, Dubai. I said, where do you feel safer today, Paris or Dubai? And he said, Dubai. I said, where do you feel safer today, Bombay or Dubai? He said, Dubai. In Dubai, my wife and children can walk out at four in the morning and go for a walk. I can't do that in Bombay. I can't do that in New Delhi for sure. And I can't do that in London or Paris or New York. So really, we're in such a special place. Uh, and I think uh, Dubai will continue to attract a, a huge uh, influx of expatriates as well, as well as the local population growth. And I think anyone missing out on what is going to be the most phenomenal growth story of the century should, uh, should think again. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay, last two. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the gentleman there. Yeah. Uh, my question is more on culture and value. I think you have given a uh, lot of importance to that uh, in your growth. As an entrepreneur, when you are go growing from a family organization to a corporate uh, organization, how do you retain those uh, culture and value and how do you really tell your 10,000 employees to live them every day every moment? So uh, so I think firstly it comes down to recruiting you know you make sure you recruit the leadership that that at least shares similar values uh, and, uh, and, the, and, I, and I truly believe we have that in the Al Shrawi group we have leadership that really shares a lot of my personal values but also goes beyond uh, I mean, I'm learning from them when it comes to the kind of my value development. Uh, so I think it all comes down to picking the right talent uh, and ensuring that that talent is reflective as well. And someone asked the question earlier, uh, you know, how do I, you know, how do I self-improve? How do I correct myself in an environment like this? And I think a lot of it comes down to personal reflection. Uh, I think it's extremely important for an individual to have the time to personally reflect, and that could be for many of us, that's you know the time of prayer, uh, but for others, it's a time of, of yoga. Uh, it could and it could just be a time where you're alone in a room for for five ten minutes. And I think if you take that time out and say, you know, what did I do wrong, particularly at the end of the day, you know, how was my day not fulfilling? You know, who did I hurt along this way? Was I compassionate enough? How could I have done this differently? Did I lose my temper when I shouldn't have? And when you have those reflections and you say, look, tomorrow is, going to, is a new day, and I'm going to make sure I don't do this and I don't do that, uh, it, it turns out to be a really rewarding journey. And that's really what I, what I follow. Yes, yeah, gentlemen. Yes. Ask. Hi, Naveen. Just wonderful hearing you. And uh, thanks for sharing your ideas about leadership. I would like to ask, uh, wh what are the three toughest, like, toughest decisions you have taken as a leader? So I take it you're taking professionally, talking professionally, right? Yes, yes, indeed. Okay, three toughest decisions. Um, I think the first and foremost that really immediately comes to my mind because it's so recent uh, was the, the decision uh, that my father took, uh, but in consultation with me, with me and my brothers uh, on entering into education because that was a huge move. Uh, you know, one that would, where we're putting several hundred million uh, dollars into the education space. And we know we had to weigh the pros and cons. So that was a really, really big decision. The other one was, if I really turn the clock back, uh, was, you know, I graduated Warden and I did pretty well at Warden. So uh, I, I obviously had the opportunity to work in the United States. Uh, but uh, due to a whole host of circumstances, uh, I wanted to come back to Dubai. Uh, and of course, in terms of if I weighed it purely financially, it, at that time, it didn't make sense. Um, but you know, I, you, find, you know, I found myself in the right place at the right time, and you know, the rest is history, uh, so as they say. So I think coming back to Dubai after my after my graduation uh, was was important. And then I think um, uh, when I turned 40, which was about six years ago, uh, I you know I took the decision to re-educate myself. So I did my master's program at London Business School, and as we speak, I'm studying again. I'm doing a master's program in education entrepreneurship in, in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania. So I travel every month now to Philadelphia and study there. In fact, my son's there too doing his undergrad, so I get to see him as well. So we're both, both students in the same, same university. But that was a big decision too. That was a big decision uh, you know, in terms of re-educating myself because it's a lot, a lot of work and a lot of late nights and a lot of all-nighters and a lot of coffee. Uh, and at the same time, you know, you've got to you know, manage or be with your family and you've got to manage your businesses, so you've got to juggle a lot of balls uh, in the air. So um, these, are, these are the three, three big ones. Fantastic. Great. Thanks a ton, Naveen. That was very interesting, very insightful. I'm sure 
a lot of audience who's here and online is going to enjoy this content and enrich their way of doing business. I would like to request uh, Geeta and Rizwana to come up and give the memento to our chief guest today. The Network 18 team would like to give a moment, yes, so I would like, like to, to request Sudha. Manisha Natarajan, Lakshmi. Lakshmi. To felicitate uh, Mr. Balwan. Thank you.